Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry. I'm your host, Romo Gassain, and today we have with us Jay Smith, who will continue to talk to us about the life of Muhammad. First of all, welcome to the show, Jay. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, Jay, as we've been going through segment after segment, we've been learning a lot more about Muhammad, and we've been able to do a critical test to find out what type of prophet he was. And we were able to compare that to the uh, biblical analysis of what a prophet is. On this segment, I'd like to ask, who is he a prophet for? Oh, well, that's fascinating because it's important that we do ask that. Uh, obviously, when you ask a Muslim that, they'll say, well, he's a prophet for everyone, mm. for all peoples, all places, all times. But we need to be more specific. Certainly, is he a prophet for the Arabs? And this is the question I usually bring up to Muslims. Look at the Quran and see what the Quran. Now, the Quran is very clear that he is a prophet for Arabs. In fact, it says over and over again. Let me just read the, the references to you. When you look at Surah 2, Ayah 119, when you look at Surah 14, Ayah 4, if you look at Surah 17, Ayah 93, Surah 26, Ayah 195 and 196, Surah 27, Ayah 91, Surah 42, Ayah 7, Surah 43, Ayah 3, Surah 46, Ayah 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight, nine places where he is a Arab prophet with an Arab revelation for the Arab people. It's obvious that the Quran is very clear that this is an Arab prophet with an Arab revelation. Mm. And it seemed to suggest that much of the Quran points to Muhammad as a prophet for the Arab people. These are all the Meccan surahs. So these are the surahs uh, that were the first revealed according to Islamic tradition. It's only when you get to the Medinan surahs that you get this universal application. And when you go to the Medinan surahs and you look at Surah 33, Ayah 40, and Surah 34, Ayah 28, do you get this universal application. So even the Quran suggests that he is a uh, prophet primarily for the Arab people. I remember um, when, whenever I open up the Quran and when I read it, I'm reading it in English, and I hear Muslims at Speaker's Corner always stop me and say, no, 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 you must read it in Arabic. Why? Why do they say that? They said because that's the true Quran. The Quran is not, cannot be understood in any other language. It can only really be understood in, in Arabic. That's God's holy language. He used an Arab prophet. He brought an Arab book, an Arab revelation in the Arab language. That is the language that God, language that God used. And I have to stop and scratch my head. Mm. In fact, I, I play the Mickey on them, and I always turn to the crowd. I said, okay, let's just take that on board. If this Part. And I, I always keep a Quran that has both Arabic and English. Mm -hmm. Now you notice, I underline yes. the English part. I don't underline the Arabic part. Mm -hmm. Right. Because for Muslim, the Arabic part of the Quran is the true Quran. This is nothing, this is not even a translation. What they say in this one, this is the interpretation of the meaning of the noble Quran. So this can nothing, be nothing more than an interpretation. Mm -hmm. You cannot really translate Arabic. Mm -hmm. It is God's holy language. It is above all other languages. Well, I love to hear that question because that suggests to me that this is nothing more than an Arab revelation for the Arab people. And more, one more, I say, take a look in, at the Muslim world today. How many Muslims read Arabic? Only 15% of all Muslims even read Arabic. That's right. So that suggests to me that this book is only for 15% of the Muslim world. Well, read it and understand it, there that is, go. yes. 85% of the Muslim world don't even read Arabic. Yes. So if the Arabic is, if this is an Arabic revelation, that comes to an Arab prophet, it probably just for the Arab people. Now, you take a look at this book over here. This book is the Bible in English. Mm. We don't even have to have Hebrew. Or if we get to the New Testament, we don't even have to have Greek here. Yes. We know that this is a good translation. In fact, we have been able to translate this book into 2,500 languages. Every two weeks, another language comes online. Mm. Within 60 years, Every known language on earth will have the New Testament in its, uh, uh, at least a book of the New Testament in its language. Uh, if we 93% of the world's population now have the New Testament in their own native tongue. I mean, that's a really important point because God's message uh, transcends uh, language barriers. 
It should. Yes. If God is universal. Mm. If God is only for the Arab people, if God can only reveal himself to one people in one language from with one prophet that is only for the Arabs, then, then I would say this is a God and this is a revelation for the Arabs only and not for me. And so do Muslims say or believe that God speaks Arabic and that's his language? No, uh, it depends on the Muslim you talk to. A lot of the Muslims assume that Arabic is a language that God has always used. Mm. Now stop and ask yourself, historically is that viable? No, <laughs> do, that's right. Do we even have any reference to Arabic before the second century AD? Mm. Or I'm sorry, BC? No, in fact, the, even the Arabic language itself we don't have much reference to Arabic language before the 7th century or the 6th century. The Quran is one of the first uh, revelations or even the first books we have that's in good Arabic. Prior to that, it was Nabation. It comes from the Nabation script. Prior to that, it comes from out of the Hebraic script because uh, it it's a sister or uh, uh, revelation. In fact, Hebrew is much older than Arabic is. Arabic is a much newer language. Mm. So, so even that notion that God only speaks Arabic suggests that God's a very new God. Yes. And certainly his language is very new. But also it also suggests that he's no longer universal. He's only for the Arab people. He's local. Very mm. local. My God comes down and lets us read his revelation in every language. And you can understand his revelation in every language, mm. which suggests pretty highly that this God is a universal God. He yes. comes down our level and incorporates and incarnates himself in our own tongue. Thank God we've got a God like that. But let's get back to Muhammad as an Arab prophet. Is he a prophet for the Arabs? I would suggest that he pretty much is a prophet for the Arabs, at least what the Quran is suggesting. Now, the next question is, is he a prophet for the Jews? Well, I think we can look through the Quran. We'll find reference after reference that's, uh, that's not only uh, attacks the Jews, but is deleterious. But don't just look at the Quran. Look and see how Muhammad treated the Jews. Mm. We've already talked about the story earlier in these episodes where uh, when Muhammad moved to Medina, he wanted to a, uh, ally himself with the Jews that were there, the three major Jewish tribes, the Banu Kainuka family, the Banu Nadir family, and the Banu Qurayza family. And by 624, that relationship broke down, and so immediately he started confronting the Jews. And we know after the Battle of Badr, he threw out the Banu Kainuka family out of Medina and took all the provisions for himself and for his, his followers. A year later, after the battle of Uhud, he then uh, confronted the Banu Nadir family, the second biggest family there in Medina, threw them up to Khaybar in the north. And then in 627, uh, the last remaining Jewish tribe, the largest Jewish family there in Medina, the Banu Qurayza family, when they refused to support him in the Battle of the Trenches, he not only attacked him, and for 20 days, for 21 days we know that he attacked their garrison or their um, uh, fortified uh, holdings outside of Medina. After three weeks, they then gave up and he took all 800 of their men and had their throats slit. Wow. Took their women as concubines for his men and the children as slaves. Now, if you would ask me, does that suggest that he is a prophet for those people? I would say no, absolutely not. No. Ask any Jew if they would accept him as a prophet. And Jews would not accept him as a prophet for the very same reason that we uh, talked about earlier, that he does not fulfill the four criteria that all Jews demand of every prophet because the Bible says that every prophet, if he's in the prophetic line, if he is a prophet and has a mantle of prophet, he should be in the prophetic race. Mm -hmm. Muhammad's not. He should also have a revelation that corresponds with previous revelation. He does not. He should also do something to prove he's a prophet. He could not. And he should know Miracles. what God he refers to, mm -hmm. what God he represents, who must be the God that we see in this book. Mm. And that God has a specific name. We know his name is Yahweh. So. I, 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 don't, I don't think any Jew would accept that he's a prophet for them. How about for us as Christians? Is he a prophet for us? Well, we would have the same demands that the Jews would have. We would also look to those the same four criteria that the Jews demand of him because the revelation that is there is also a revelation for us. And God yes. has always specifically stipulated that any prophet must come from a certain line, must say a certain thing, must do a certain thing, and must represent me. So we would also, like the Jews, reject Muhammad because he doesn't fulfill any of those four criteria. More than that, look and see what the Quran says about Jews and Christians. And I, I refer back to Surah 2, Ayah 120, Surah 3, Ayah 28, and Surah 5, Ayah 54. Let me quote. They all three say the same thing. And it says this, O ye who believe, take not the Jews and Christians for your friends and protectors. They are but friends and protectors to each other. And he amongst you that turns to them for friendship is of them. Verily Allah guideth not a people unjust. So it's obviously he's not much of a friend to us. 
I remember uh, in Surah 9, Ayah 29, it's very clear that the Quran says, make war on the people of the book, the Ali Kitab. Wow. That means Jews and Christians. They're to make war upon us mm. until we pay the zakat, until we pay the jizya tax or the, the taxation that is, you, that is specifically applied to the Ali Kitab. So it doesn't seem to the Quran would suggest that he's a, our prophet. And I would concur with the Quran. He certainly is not my prophet. I would reject him as a prophet very quickly. And as a Christian, I mean, how very different is that to what Jesus taught? Well, when you see very clearly, Jesus taught that not only must a prophet follow those criteria, but also a prophet must point to him. And as a Christian, that's probably the biggest criteria right there. Does Muhammad point to Jesus? We're going to talk in a future episode concerning who really uh, Isa is in the Quran. I don't want to uh, take time to do that right now. But does Muhammad point to Jesus? When you look and see what Muhammad does with Jesus, it doesn't point to Jesus I know, but also the, the problems I have with the Muhammad there and what he does with Jesus, uh, not only does he uh, misappropriate Jesus, just take a look at the 93 references to Jesus in the Quran, going back to this book, and you will see that Muhammad is inferior to Jesus in almost every respect. And you look at even at the references we have to Jesus in the Quran, though it's whether or not he is the Jesus we know. Nonetheless, if it's the Jesus they know, it's the Jesus they point to, even that Jesus, whose name is Issa, has huge problems. Hmm. He, doesn't, he doesn't at all uh, claim to be divine. He rejects his divinity. He confuses himself with Mary as part of the Trinity in Surah 5 via 116 as if the two of them are to be worshipped. I don't know of any Christian that would accept that Mary is to be worshipped. Do you know of any? No. Not even the Catholics would say that. Mm. Now, there is some suggestion that there was a group at the time of Muhammad named the Coloridians. It was a female sect that elevated Mary to the status of divinity. Possibly that's where that verse is, is attacking. If that is so, then whoever wrote Surah 5 via 116 is not referring to Christianity mm -hmm. and doesn't refer to the church. He's referring to a specific sect, proving that the Quran comes from a very specific place, from a specific time, and is referring to a specific problem, mm -hmm. not a universal application. But the Jesus that I see in the Quran, not only does that, he, he is puzzling even as a child. In Surah 19, uh, you see that he... Uh, needs some food, he and his mother are hungry. And so he bends down a tree and takes the fruit from it, or shakes the tree in some cases it says, so that, the, that he can, he and his mother can eat, like a super baby. Mm. That time, I don't remember Jesus doing that as a baby. <laughs> uh, Surah 349 says that he takes these, this clay and forms it into the, the shape of a bird and then blows it and flies up to there. So he creates birds out of clay. I don't remember Jesus doing that. Do you remember that? No. None of these stories are mentioned in the Gospels. No. Well, we know where these stories come from. We can trace almost all of them to the lost books of the Bible, almost all of them to Gnostic writings. Wow. For, which first appear in the late second century, much too late to be authoritative, and of course, give us a totally different view of Jesus than what we see in the Gospel accounts. And please explain to our viewers what the word Gnostic means. What do we mean, what do we mean by Gnostic Gospels? Well, the Gnostic Gospels were written by the Gnostic sect. The Gnostics or, or were people that did not believe that God would take on bodily form because they believed that the body itself was evil. Mm -hmm. God would not incorporate evil, uh, material, uh, uh, a material form. Didn't need to. So therefore, Jesus could not be God. Uh, and that they would believe that salvation could not, would not be needed from God who take on a human form, that salvation came through knowledge, pure knowledge. And uh, that's what gnosis means, means knowledge, and that's why they're called themselves the Gnostics. So there's all these Gospels that were written by these later writers who were attacking these notions of Jesus being God. And, and they don't represent Christianity. Not for a number of reasons. Not yes. only do they contradict and confront the gospel account of Jesus and his Christology and, and his divinity, mm. but they're also written much, much later. They don't even begin to appear until the mid to late second century, long so, after the gospel accounts were had already been canonized. So these stories, these accounts were taken from non-Christian accounts yeah. and borrowed and placed in the Quran. That's what you're saying. Well, what's interesting, and this is yet to be published, there is a book that's being written right now by John Gilchrist in, out of South Africa where he's gone back and he's looked at all the references to Jesus or Issa in the Quran. And when he's looked at all these, he's been able to trace all these back to the Nag Hammadi Gospel. The Nag Hammadi are a compilation of Gnostic writings. Wow. 
proving that the Jesus that we see here is not the biblical Jesus. Mm. He's not the Jesus of the gospel. He's not the Jesus of history. He's nothing more than a Gnostic Jesus. Wow. They've got the wrong Jesus. But nonetheless, uh, we're, we're talking about Muhammad now. And if Muhammad is the one that actually receives this revelation, the person of Jesus that he has in his revelation is of Jesus I don't recognize. So I could not accept him as a Christian as my prophet. That would mm. eradicate his authority as my prophet. Um, there's other things that, uh, uh, that we need to look at, and that is, what about his concession to other people? We know that, uh, that he conceded marriage, for instance, the muta marriages that are found in the traditions that stipulate that whenever a Muslim is traveling or whenever they're in warfare, that he would allow them to marry not married, but to have a contract uh, with women who are at the mosques for either three hours or up to 90 days or sometimes 90 years. You could go ahead and pay for that. It's another form of prostitution. Mm. When they're away from their wives on traveling or in the context of war, they could do that. Now that's a huge concession. Yes. Now that's not to say that the Muslims today do that, but that's certainly in the traditions at the time of the Prophet himself. There are other uh, problems. Certainly, we know that, uh, that he had a problem with sin. And Muslims come to me and they always say, all the prophets are sinless. And I have to scratch my head on that. Because you can look through, and we don't have time to do that right now. We can look through every one of the prophets in the Quran, and you can see every one of the prophets sin. Sin after sin after sin. We know a number of times where Muhammad had to ask forgiveness of sins. Let me refer to the text themselves. If you look at Surah 40, Ayah 55. If you look at Surah 47, Ayah 19. If you look at Surah 48, Ayah 1 and 2. If you look at Surah 94, Ayah 1 to 3, you will see where Muhammad over and over again has to ask forgiveness for sins. Mm. Now, Muslims come back to me all the time. They say, no, no, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. That's not a problem. He was a sinner when he was a prophet. I'm sorry, when he was a man. Once he became a prophet, he no longer sinned. Okay. Well, here's the difficulty with that. When you look at the Quran itself, you can even unpack that. And you can say, hold on, if he was a sinner before he became a prophet, what are you going to do with Surah 48, Ayah 1 and 2? Because Surah 48, Ayah 1 and 2, and let me just read it to you, because I think it's important that we do read this rather than just say it off the top of our heads. And uh, it says here, Verily, we give you, O Muhammad, a manifest victory. So this is referring to Muhammad, verse 1, verse 2. That Allah may forgive you your sins of the past and the future and complete His favor on you and guide you on a straight path. Mm. So it's very clear in the Quran that Muhammad not only sinned before he was a prophet, he continues to sin even as a prophet wow. on both sides of his prophethood. So let me ask you, Rommel, does this sound like a prophet who was sinless? No. No. To end this whole area, what I'd like to do is do a comparison between Jesus and Muhammad. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we do that. Yes. Because most Muslims, when I talk about Muhammad, they would say, yes, he is the final prophet, he is the greatest prophet, he is the seal of all prophets, which means he is the one that's greater than everyone that came before. And I always like to, I always love to, um, uh, to bring that up in conversation. I was in Dearborn just back in June, and I went down to the big Arab festival there in Dearborn. At the Arab festival, they came up to me, and there was a guy with a sign, and it had Jesus and Muhammad. We love both. And I went up to the man and said, "Oh, I'm glad you have Jesus above Muhammad." <laughs> You're right. Jesus should always be above Muhammad. Jesus is greater. And of course, he didn't like that. I said, he said "No, you, they're both equal." I said, "No, they're not equal. Even your Quran stipulates that they're not equal." Mm. Let me just show you why. And so, right there in front of the whole crowd. I just open up the Quran. I always keep my Quran with me. He didn't have any Quran. Rarely do you find Muslims with Qurans on them. They don't like to bring their Quran, and they don't like us to open it and read it in public because <coughs> they believe that maybe we are uh, we don't have we haven't cleaned our hands or we haven't uh, done the ablutions and all the rest. But I said, okay. let's open up and let's just ask this question, even according to this book. Now, this is not my revelation. It's not your revelation. We don't consider it authoritative, but it is authoritative for the Muslims. So let's ask that question. Is this book, does this book uh, give credits or give authority, give even superiority to Jesus over Muhammad, like that sign seemed to suggest? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. Let me just show you how. Okay. You can just look at four verses. We've already referred to them earlier, but let's go back to them. And let's start with Surah 19, Ayah 20. 
Surah 19, ayah 20, refers to the fact that Jibril comes to Mary and says, Behold, uh, I'm giving you a son. Let's start in verse 19. We're going to come back to that. Mary is a virgin who has not yet been touched. Hmm. Now, that's highly significant right there. Was, because that suggests that Jesus was born miraculously. So his birth already suggests that there's something unique about him. Was Muhammad hmm. born miraculously? No. No. He was born from Amina, his mother. Yes. Abdullah, his father, died before he was born. But that already suggests that there's something unique about Jesus above and beyond Muhammad. Even at his birth, he was born of a virgin. I always ask my Muslim friend, okay, he's born of a virgin. Why is that significant? They say, well, it's not important. I say, it's highly important. <laughs> now, you don't have an answer, do you? And he says, no. Well, so what are you supposed to do when you don't have an answer? Surah 10, ayah 94. Surah 21, ayah 7. It says very clearly, if you have any question, come, come to, to the, the al the, the people of the book. Why? Yes. Because we've been given the Torah and the angel mm. for you. Come to us and ask us, and let me tell you why that's important. You want to find why that's important, you need to go back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Because mm -hmm. there, Isaiah says, this shall be a sign to you. Come on, Muslims, this is a sign to you as well. A virgin will conceive. Hugely important, because virgins in my world do not conceive. I don't know if they do in yours, <laughs> no. well, but they don't conceive in mine. Yes. So, a virgin will conceive. So, in other words, wake up. Something spectacular is happening. This is something out of the ordinary. And bear a son, not a girl, but a boy. Mm. Bear a son. And who shall he be called? Emmanuel. God with us. So, when a virgin conceives, as we see in Surah 19, Ayah 20, this is God with us at this time. That was 800 years before Jesus was conceived. We see a prophecy of just that event. And here the Quran even supports that. Yes. Then I go to Surah 3, Ayah 46. As an infant, he talks from the cradle. So even as an infant, he's able to do something Muhammad. Could Muhammad talk from the cradle? No. No, but Jesus could. So he was born of a virgin. He's born miraculously. As a child, he was able to talk from the cradle. In Surah 3, Ayah 49, that we've referred to quite a few times already in this episode, he takes these birds, blows on them, and they fly from the air, so he's able to create out of nothing. Could Muhammad create anything? No. No, we don't know of any miracle. We've already gone through that. Mm. Even the six times that he was asked to do a miracle, every time he says, I'm nothing more than a warner. I'm nothing more than a messenger. And then it says that he gave sight to the blind. He healed the lepers. Could Muhammad give sight to anybody? Could he heal anybody? No. Absolutely not. And then it says that he resuscitated the dead. Muhammad could do anything like that. So already we now have six areas that Jesus is superior. And then I love to come back to Surah 19, Ayah 19. Bring it home again. Surah 19. Jibril says to Mary, Behold, I'm giving you a righteous son, a sinless son, a wow. pure son. Wow. Jesus is the righteous one. <laughs> Only he is given that title. Nowhere else do you find any other person or prophet that is called righteous. Only Jesus is. The only sinless one in the Quran is Jesus. Do Muslims know this? They're not aware of this. And I found always when I Muslims are questioning, say, even your Quran shows, has some truth in it. Wow. It's not my authority. It's not your authority, but it's their authority. Jesus is unique. He is the sinless one. He mm. fulfills even not that, no, uh, that which no other prophet can do. Come on home. What a person we have. Jesus is greater than any other. Yes. Jesus is superior to any other and certainly superior to Muhammad. Yes. Jay, perhaps in a minute or two you can explain to us where the Quran stops short of this person Jesus. We're talking about him. Let's go a little bit further and let's declare him. Well, Obviously, the Quran falls hugely short because beyond the fact that he can do miracles, he eradicates and de denies his divinity. Mm. Surah 4, Ayah 171 says very clearly that he's not part of the Trinity. It says very clearly that he's not the Son of God. It says very clearly in Surah 5, Ayah 72 that, he is, has, that God has no partners, that, Muhammad, that, that Jesus cannot be God because he is, he's a, nothing more than a partner of God. It suggests he's a partner of God. Surah 5, Ayah 75 says that God does not eat. Jesus eat, therefore he, therefore he cannot be God. Surah 5, Ayah 116, has Jesus and Mary denying that they could be worshipped. Now, where in the world did Mary should be worshipped? But the, even Jesus denying that he could be worshipped. And then Surah 6, Ayah 101, very clearly says that God has no wife, assuming that Mary is wife. We're going to pull this apart a little bit more, uh, probably in one of our future episodes, looking at these problems with these verses. Yes. But probably the most tragic area, the most tragic area, is Surah 4, Ayah 157, where it's very clear that Jesus does not die, mm. does not get crucified. Another dies in his place. Another is crucified. And just that one verse destroys my Jesus. Yes. Damns me to eternity. Thank God my Jesus died. 
Yes. Don't come back to the Muhammad here. Come back to the real Jesus, the real prophet, who stands heads and shoulders above any other prophet, and certainly above Muhammad, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jay, thank you for your time once thank again. You. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Please stay tuned for the very next episode of Midnight Divine. Thank you.